Hello, and welcome to the View from Mayor Brown podcast. This is a fortnightly podcast series for employment lawyers and HR practitioners, which highlights developments in case law and legislative changes of importance to UK employers. It is presented by Nicholas Robertson, the head of Mayor Brown's London employment team. The time spent listening to these podcasts can count towards your training requirements. At the end of the podcast, we will explain how to get in touch if you have any comments or questions. So, hello and uh, welcome to this uh, special guest episode podcast. I'm delighted to be joined once again by uh, David Reid, QC. David, I think, has now been on this podcast uh, a sufficient number of times. He hardly, hardly needs an introduction, but we'll give him one nonetheless. Um, uh, David, uh, senior um, silk at Littleton Chambers and uh, one of the uh, very uh, top QCs for employment matters uh, in England and Wales. So, David, delighted to have you on again and that you're willing to submit yourself to questioning one more time. Well, thank you. What that clearly means is I may be a guest, but I'm no longer special. <laughs> <laughs> OK, guest, but no longer special. We'll run with that. So what we're going to talk about um, is um, a subject of increasing importance, I think, particularly in tribunals. It applies in High Court too, but I think we're going to focus today mostly on tribunals, tribunal cases, and it's the issue of confidentiality. Um, we've seen a number of cases with the press trying to obtain details of hearings or whatever, parties wanting to try and preserve confidentiality, um, and we thought it would be a great idea to have a discussion today around um, what's the, what are the general rules in tribunals and how can you maintain confidentiality over things that might otherwise be um, a um, something that is in, in the public domain and therefore uh, disclosable, publishable, whatever. So, David, I'm, I'm right in saying, of course, that the principle of the, the, the basic principle is that justice should be open and transparent and justice should be seen to be done, etc. So, the, the, the default position is open you know, justice. Open justice. And the, it's important just to recognise that the rationale for the principle of open justice is twofold, really. One, there's an, a right. Uh, an Article 6 right for parties to have a fair and public hearing in relation to their disputes, and that's a right that's enjoyed by both parties. But also what the courts recognise, and there's a, a number of authorities that make this absolutely clear, is that there's a public interest in open justice in the sense that that is the mechanism by which one ensures that the judiciary are open and above board in their conduct of litigation. The idea being that if you have secret or closed courts, there is no safeguard against the impartial, against the partial or misapplication of the law. But open justice means that all can scrutinise those who make judgment and decisions. And that's a, a wider public interest than just between the parties. Just between the parties. And that's important, I suspect. It is absolutely so. critical in the way that the courts have approached this, because in a sense they're saying, <laughs> we have to be open to scrutiny, and therefore we take the position that all that we should do is open to scrutiny too. OK, so let's, let's, let's start at the beginning. Tribunal claim, claim gets lodged... Um, and um, the parties, I think I'm right to say the parties and very basic details end up on a public register, don't they? And so that, that's something right from the get-go. There is a degree of publicity attached to this. Well, that's an e end result that will happen. Right. So, so, so the order of events has changed, although if you scratch around, it's a little hard to find specifically where the rules deal with this. Um, years ago, um, it used to be the case, when I say years ago, not many years ago, maybe only eight or nine years ago, when someone issued a claim form, um, the claim form and the employer's response to it were available yes. as public documents. It was usually necessary to travel um, uh, to Bury St Edmunds, which was considered to be a sufficient deterrent for many people <laughs> to ensure that they remained confidential, but you could obtain them. And if you had a case which involved a high level of confidentiality, I remember a few I was involved in, and you wanted to restrict, as we'll look at later on, you actually had to apply almost immediately that the claim was issued to the Employment Tribunal to get an order of restriction. Um, it's still the case in civil proceedings outside the Employment Tribunal that claim forms, defences are all open to public scrutiny. But now tribunal claim forms aren't. And so actually the initiation of the claim 
will not be um, evident publicly to anyone. Right. The process of the claim will not be evident to anyone until you get to a public hearing. And, and your case management hearing is not a public hearing. Right. It's a private hearing. However, having said that, there are two points where whatever you do, um, subject to other restrictions, it'll become evident. First is, slightly surprisingly, um, but in the world of trying to make a bit of cash on the side, um, the lists of cases are available to the press and subscribers by a service called CourtServe, which people pay for. And, um, the, and the result is that the press get early views on the lists of cases in, say, the Employment Tribunal in central right. London, and therefore are able to scroll down the lists of what's forthcoming as the bill of fare and see if there's a tasty-looking morsel by way of a respondent, <laughs> which yes. is why you find that the press might turn up in the hope that it's a public hearing. So the first glimmer is that it will be unusual for you to avoid the fact that your name will appear on a cause list. Hmm. Second point is that now... Even if the claim is withdrawn, whether by agreement or otherwise, there is a need for there to be a final resolution of the proceedings. And even if it's withdrawn, it's going to be dismissed on withdrawal, and that will be a judgment. And since February of 2017, there's now a publicly maintained register of judgments that's searchable on the web. And so if, for example, a claim is brought against uh, my business and I may do a settlement or the claimant might simply withdraw, but I get a dismissal of that claim, there will be a page that will say that the claim was brought. It will record the coding that the tribunal service use to identify the type of case. So if it's a sex discrimination case, it'll have a SDA. If it's race it'll have the yeah. relevant mark so you can see the nature of the case and it will say what happened to the litigation so uh, and this has caused some consternation because obviously it means that you can do a search by a particular name or company see who's brought claims might be helpful because you might see who a serial claimant is yeah. uh, or it might be a hindrance because you might um, be evident as being an employer who seems to have a lot of claims brought against them. But that, I'm afraid, subject to the limited powers which we'll look at about restriction, is something that, in principle, you're stuck with. You're stuck with. So from the point at which you've pressed go and the pro claim is in process, there will be an element of, of, of public access irrespective of the outcome. Irrespective, yeah. Okay. Let's talk, talk about documents then on the way through the tribunal case. Yes. Because this is something that, again, causes quite a lot of angst around, uh, because as we all know, the mere fact a document is confidential, there's not a reason for not giving disclosure. So what's the position around tribunal documents, um, statements, statements of claim perhaps that are included in the tribunal bundle? Bit of a portmanteau question. But yes. No, no, no. Um, <coughs> so... You start off from that proposition that private hearings are private hearings. Yep. The critical pivot point is when you get to a public hearing. So if I have a public hearing of a claim, unfair dismissal, whatever, and there's a bundle of documents, yep. there'll be witness statements. Yep. Anyone who comes to the hearing has the ability as a member of the public or the press to see the witness statements as people give evidence and to have sight of any document that's referred to in the course of the hearing right and the most recent presidential guidance um, in relation to the employment tribunals requires you to have not only witness statements at the back of the court but also a copy of the tribunal bundle so that people can follow the case. So even though we're not exactly strangers to a situation where there's a bundle with some documents that are not referred to during the hearing, the presidential guidance would indicate that if you put it in a tribunal bundle, you're probably going to have to accept that it's going to be visible. Viewed, viewed yes. By the now, that is slightly odd because, in a sense, um, it hasn't actually come into the public domain unless the tribunal have been specifically directed to it or read. Yes. But the guidance says you have a bundle at the back. Now, 
There then is a little area of greyness, which, um, if you are a member of the press, please close your eyes, ears now. There's an area of greyness which has never quite come to clarity in the tribunal, and that's this. In the High Court, and indeed in the um, criminal courts, because famously this was a case involving Westminster Magistrates Court that the Guardian took to the Court of Appeal, the principle is accepted that if a court looks at a document, a member of the public can ask for a copy on paying reasonable copy fees. Now, we'll come on to the ability to keep things confidential, which is possible, yes. but we're starting from the basic open position. And so, uh, and this was recently reconsidered in the civil world um, in a case in the summer of this year called Dring. But in the Employment Tribunal, I've never actually had anyone come along and ask to take copies of the bundle. I have had someone come along and ask to take copies of the witness statements, uh, and that was a member of the press. Yes. And as a result of waving under the employment judge's nose a copy of the Westminster Magistrates case, the Employment Tribunal actually allowed the press to take away the witness statements photocopy them and bring the originals back. Now, there's a strong argument to say that faced with the way the case law is in the civil courts, if you as a member of the press or a member of the public turned up and said, I would like to have a copy of those documents which have been referred to in this employment tribunal hearing, I'm willing to pay the reasonable copying costs, you should be entitled to have a copy because it's become public. I've never seen that yet happen with bundled documents. Um, but you must think that given the direction of travel, the increasing interest the press has in tribunal cases, in my experience, that's only a matter of time before that issue is going to have to be addressed. Yes, yes. And of course, it's not only the press that might have an interest in gathering that particular information. In the High Court case I was thinking of during, the people who are interested, it was an asbestosis claim which yeah. settled at trial, and the people who are interested in seeing court documents and obtaining copies were people representing other claimants who wanted to obtain copies of experts' reports, useful material, which is ground that had been covered by other parties in a different claim. Is there any... Uh, if you are given disclosure of documents by another party to litigation, of course it's covered by the implied undertaking, you will only use it for the purpose of litigation. Yes. Is there any equivalent restriction on the use that a party can make of a document it's gained through the litigation process, say a member of the press? Uh, can they only, or, or, or take your asbestosis game, is there any restriction on a party using those documents for its own purposes... In, 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 in a completely different set of litigation, for example. So, so the, there's no implicit restriction on what you do with the documents given to you okay. well, in those circumstances. So, number one, it's right that in civil proceedings there's an express rule that says that if you receive disclosed documents, you can only use them for the purpose of the proceedings. Yes. Um, there's no explicit rule in the Employment Tribunal to that effect, although the Employment Tribunal rules contemplate directly that when a tribunal orders disclosure, it's making disclosure in accordance with the powers under the civil courts, and therefore I've always taken it, and I think people do, regarded as being implicit that you get the disclosure subject Absolutely. to that caveat. However... A party is no different to a member of the public the minute that document becomes public. So, so if I pursue a piece of litigation and the tribunal hearing happens and there are documents which are referred to in the other side, all bets are off. The minute Gosh, I, um, I, I can use that. them for any purpose I want to use them for. Wow. Because any member of the public could have them. The, and the civil proceedings, ex, the civil rules expressly provide that. They expressly provide that the caveat on the use of the documentation is only a caveat until the point that the documents become public, which they do if they're referred to in an open public hearing or they're read by the judge for the purpose of the case. OK, so that's, so, a, fur that's a further issue that parties need to be aware of, um, even if both parties can be trusted to maintain a degree of confidentiality around the use of a document once it's in open court. The, the, all bets are off. Yes, and I, I've you know, and you do get cases where 
one is um, skeptical sure. about the applications that are being made for disclosure as to whether or not people are looking for material that may be of assistance in terms of other aspects oh, okay. of the case. Classic example would be I've got a tribunal claim, but I've also got a lurking high court claim, let's say for bonus or wrongful dismissal that I haven't started. And I'm look using the tribunal process to obtain documents or look at materials to see whether or not there's any merit in that particular case. Um, I mean, in theory, of course, if I know where things lie and I brought the other proceedings, I'd still just ask for the disclosure again, knowing what there is. But in fact, if those documents form part of the bundle and I'm referring to them uh, at the hearing, they're public and I can use them without restriction. Th this is on the basic understand no restriction level. We're going to talk about restrictions in just a second. Just, just Let's just finish the process. Tribunal court, uh, tribunal judgments. Yes, we've talked about the situation that effectively goes on the register uh, with the outcome. What about the judgments themselves? The reasons for the judgment, yes. subject again to the restrictions that might be imposed, they are entirely public as a, 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 as a document, so no restriction on that. Um, and there is an interesting question, um, which again has never really been resolved, um, and. Occasionally one muses about it, which is this. I've got a claim. The claim's against your company. I make a number of allegations against employees in the organisation. Let's say it's not a discrimination claim and I don't identify them as individuals. Yes. That may be academic. You're still liable for what's going on. There might be people who you no longer employ who I'm yes. raising actions against. The tribunal judgment will deal with the case and reach decisions. But unless those individuals are parties or have been witnesses, things might have been said about them that they've never had the opportunity to address or rebut. Yes. Uh, and it's a public finding with determination. And one of the points which has been raised, certainly for discussion, is whether or not if you've got a case that involves... Um, serious allegations that might tangentially impact on other individuals, whether or not the tribunal ought to expressly make the caveat that they make these findings on the basis that they have not heard any evidence from people who might be impacted We've by We've had it. one of those cases where, without going into details, um, an individual was dismissed, was arguing that his behaviour was no different from an earlier incident involving two entirely different employees, where a different sanction was imposed. So entirely legitimately, the tribunal was considering an earlier unrelated issue between two individuals who had nothing to do with the actual case and made a determination that said, well, the earlier case is different because there was provocation. Well, that wasn't necessarily the case. No. But that was the... That, and and, and the, the per, one of the people found out that this determination had been made and was understandably very upset. Um, and there had been no caveating by the relevant tribunal that said, well, we're making this determination because we haven't heard from Mr X. Um, who, who would look at that judgment and say, go, well, I never even knew that yes, my circumstances and, 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 were being and, trotted so, out yes. in front of a public hearing in the employment tribunal. Exactly. So I think, I think that there's a need for a heightened sensitivity about the impact of publicity and, uh, and that's reporting. For, for, for employers too, when you, in that situation. A absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And I did have a case a few years ago um, in the police where I was for a police force and there was some, it was a serious sex discrimination claim and there were some issues in a very difficult and sensitive case. And there was some evidence about some particular officers in the case who um, weren't the subject of direct allegations and weren't witnesses, but the public findings, and in fact, even the reporting of the evidence, led to them raising complaints that the force had not acted sufficiently to safeguard their interests by warning them about the risk that this material might have been reported, made the headlines of the local newspaper, and that they should have had protections in place to secure their... 
personal um, protection from these remarks being made, or at least have the ability to know that it was coming, yes. so that they could have um, made contact with the media to make sure their views were put. Gosh, it's um, extremely tough. Okay, well, let's talk about tri tribunal privacy and disclosure restrictions. Um, what's the overview in terms of types of situation, and we'll talk about it in a little bit more detail, the types of situation where the tribunal can say, well, we know it's open, the principle is open justice, but... Yes. Well, um, it's now governed, well, it's governed in really two areas. There is an element which is governed by the tribunal rules and in part from the Employment Tribunal Act. And there's an area that brushes up to some of the work that one's dealing in this jurisdiction from the criminal law. Just looking at the tribunal rules for a moment. Sure. Um, when Lord Justice Underhill undertook his review of the rules, um, he recognised there was a bit of a problem, that the law had evolved to deal with this problem, that the tri there was a power for tribunals to restrict hearings uh, and um, the reporting of hearings, but it didn't expressly extend to judgments. Uh -huh. So, so even if the allegations were found to be unproven, the judgment was still open. Um, that was tidied up, and so the good thing is that under Rule Fifty of the Employment Tribunal Rules, there's a power, it's a wide power for the tribunal to, if it considers it's in the interests of justice, to place restrictions on the identification of parties, witnesses, restricting the disclosure of documents, providing for hearings to be in private, and also including the restriction of judgments. So it's possible, and one occasionally sees these things, where the nature of the allegations and the findings have an impact on um, all parties, there was a case that went up to the Supreme Court recently and actually lost its anonymity in the Supreme Court, oh, yeah. but it came from the Employment Tribunal concerning a school and allegations about a teacher's relationship um, with um, someone outside the school where all the parties were anonymous on the judgment. So there's a power to put quite a cloth around things. But, this is a massive but, what, what the rules expressly provide for, though, is that when the tribunal looks at the interests of justice and whether or not to place a restriction, the rules expressly provide, it's rather an odd phrase, that they've got to give full weight to the principle of open justice and Article 10 freedom of expression. Well, Article 10 freedom of expression is the press. Um, so, so what the rules are contemplating is that an employment tribunal has to say, OK, I can understand there might be a compelling reason over here for confidentiality. And typically, that's going to be Article 8 of the Human Rights Act. So it's going right. to be about privacy. Right. It's going to be either that it's about your private life, yep. um, um, sexual allegations, um, allegations which are potentially embarrassing, Yep. Um, or it's going to have privacy in terms of commercial confidentiality yep. of an acute nature. And those are Article 8 rights which, to balance, you've got to look at protecting. But over here is Article 10, and Article 10 is about freedom of, of expression and the right of newspapers to write articles. Yes. And then in the middle is Article 6, the idea about a public hearing. So the tribunal's being told, OK, you can restrict, but you've only got to restrict once you've balanced out whether or not there are more competing reasons about public privacy, sorry, public um, interest in proceedings and freedom of expression to the press that outweigh any privacy interests. Right in terms of the individuals or the material. Some things are easier than others. Okay? <laughs> right. So so I have had little difficulty, I've had little difficulty in circumstances where you've got genuinely commercially confidential information that is in the tribunal hearing. Right. And there, 
if you can make a genuine case for why that needs to be restricted, you can get it in a separate bundle. You can get the tribunal sitting in private in a narrow way in relation to that. And also, I've found the tribunal to be sympathetic to considering that when they give their judgment, they will be cautious about what they identify or say in their in their judgment. Sure. And that may reflect the fact that actually there's not a typically there's not massive interest in that bit what's much more difficult is the thing where people often want privacy which is um there's an allegation a me too type allegation yes. claimants brought it against an employer and um there's an um, there's a, a a concern to preserve anonymity in relation to that now um there is a special set of rules about sexual misconduct allegations, but it still feeds into the same privacy provisions that the tribunal can restrict reporting where there is a um, allegations of a sexual nature. Again, typically, um, that may only be until judgment. Yes. So particularly if the allegations are found proven, that may, um, uh, that you're not likely to get any form of restriction from that point on. But also, there's a problem about the press reporting the hearing. And it's that problem about full weight to Article 10. Because when it comes to Article 10, that's freedom of expression, and the press being the, the, the public for these purposes, the cases which the newspapers have run successfully lead to some propositions which immediately you might think, hmm, is that right? Um, so give the give an example. Give, 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 well, I'll give you an example. First is that the public are assumed to be able to distinguish between unproven allegations and guilt. So in other words, if a newspaper says X is accused of sexual harassment and the newspaper says... The, the case is continuing the fact that the public might um, you don't assume that the public will say there's no smoke without fire when you look at restricting reporting you assume that the public will be able to assume distinguish between unproven allegation and guilt so the fact that someone's got an allegation against them is never a reason to restrict the press reporting so that, yes. that, that's well, the problem. Right. Fine. Yes, I can see that that's, you know, if you're on the receiving end of lurid allegations, well, where the, 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 that injunction case which got, where the party got named in Parliament and, you know, there seems to be widespread assumption in the, you know, the underlying facts, which is just no evidence to support that at all. The allegations are entirely unproven and were yeah. settled without, without a, a decision. And the subject and the assumption is that the public can make that distinction. The second thing which creates um, uh, a real problem in that presumption is another case that the press ran established the proposition that you the court assumes that the press can be trusted to report accurately and sensibly any comments about a case. So you don't think, well, okay, X newspaper is the sort of newspaper who might be sensationalist or Y newspaper are likely to be balanced. The court, when it looks at whether or not it's restricting, assumes that you can trust the press to accurately report the events and circumstances. Again, another big argument for why people want to say, I don't want this to be yes. reported, is to say, well, I'm worried about sensationalist reporting. Yes. And and the, 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 the law says the tribunal has got to assume that actually it'll be fair and balanced reporting. So it tilts the balance quite significant in favour of or against trying to get confidentiality because yes. the article 10 rights seem to be sort of supercharged yes and the third one just to mention which again i think is another problematic one which in a sense one almost feels contradicts the balance reporting as you might say well okay i understand that the press needs to report hearings i understand that part of the reason for a public hearing is that the judiciary have to be scrutinised, and that's why Fine. we're writing it. But that doesn't mean you've got to name my client or name yes. the accuser. 
you can just write about it in anonymous terms. And there's a line of cases that say that the courts have to recognise that reporting the names of parties makes stories more interesting and human and therefore more likely for the public to engage in their public interest, i.e. you should always assume that you can name. So you're right that that, th that triumvirate of factors means that, to be frank, you are always starting off from a very difficult position if you're trying to restrict reporting of um, um, embarrassing or uh, lurid material because any journalist who tries to oppose that and they have to be given notice of restricted applications will say, must be assumed I'm going to report fairly, must be assumed that the public can distinguish between allegation and guilt and it's in human interest adds value to the readership prospect of this which is in the interest of publicising the wider interest of justice. So the scales are weighed, weighted quite heavily in one side rather than the other. Yes. There's then, just to add a little wrinkle to this, I mentioned the criminal law. Um, there is a wrinkle on the criminal law which also distorts uh, the, the, the balance a little bit, which is this. Um, obviously, we, we've been talking about, we've focused quite a lot on sexual allegations. Yep. There could be confidentiality about disability, and there's a prov specific provision about disability restrictions and confidentiality in the rules again. Same balancing exercise, embarrassing personal circumstances for a disability might justify restrictions. But there's also to factor into this and you occasionally seeing this being thrown into the balance is the Sexual Offences Amendment Act 1992. The Sexual Offences Amendment Act is a piece of legislation that has caused a degree of, con uh, of dispute down the years because it's a one it's a one line uh, protection. It's not gender specific. So if I'm a male and I make an allegation, um, I'm as protected as a female who makes an allegation. But it essentially provides that if you are the alleged victim of a sexual offence, it doesn't even mean that um, there has to have been a criminal prosecution, but I have to have alleged that I'm the victim of something which would amount to a right. crime. So that could be sexual assault, which could just could be touching a part of my body, yep. or you know, it doesn't. It, it, it could be that level of criminality. If I'm the victim, the Sexual Offences Amendment Act says that I am cannot be public. My identity cannot be publicised in any public broadcast medium. So the newspapers can't identify me. The the TV and media can't identify me. That is why, when you have rape trials, the identity of the victim, right. or of the alleged victim, is never publicised. And that is a lifetime um, All right. prohibition. So, so, so neither of us know the details of that case that was recently in the Court of Appeal on non-disclosure agreements. No. Okay. Um, but it was reported that there were five people who had settled claims I think it was said in some cases for significant sums of money, um, and th it was said that three of them supported the employer's stance that the injunction should be granted because they worried about being identified. It seems like this might have been an answer if you were acting for the newspaper to say, well, we can't identify them because there's a lifetime ban if they if what they were saying criminal offence if we did. Yeah. yeah. Um, so. Maybe um, so it's just the, the general new, uh, uh, the general public knowing, even if it wasn't published by a newspaper, maybe that's so. Yeah, and so of course it does mean that you've got this slightly uneven position in this respect because that's a much broader protection than the Employment Tribunal. So um, imagine this scenario. I bring an employment claim alleging that I have been the subject of a serious act of sexual harassment that amounts to a crime mm. by my employer and I name an individual manager. Uh, those are my proceedings. There's going to be a public hearing. Um, if the company and the manager want a res restricted reporting order, they are subject to that balancing exercise, brackets, 
difficult to get a restriction or an order in relation to it um, in order to um, prevent reporting. Sure. The claimant can never be identified. It doesn't matter about restricted reporting. They can't be identified in any broadcast media, newspaper or that, press. As I say, so that's the publication. So, so it's not something that applies if the employer writes to um, another employer and says... Correct. Kind of yeah. Or we had a conversation other than on yes, a yes. podcast. Yes. Um, but we haven't identified anyone by name, have we? <laughs> no. Quick go uh, back and check. <laughs> but, but in terms of the press... Yes, fine. So, so they, the complainant would have that permanent protection. Okay, um, right that um, cuts in regardless of what the tribunal deals with it about it. And the only time that might bleed into the um, respondent or the um, named respondent, of course, is that if reporting of the named respondent or the employer was such that you would lead to the identification of the claimant. Yes, which you know, so if the claimant if reporting of the case said the female chief executive of Xco did blah 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 well suddenly you, you, yeah, you, you, identify. you know if there's only one female chief exec you know exactly who it is. Couldn't report the other part. But if you got um allegation involving X, maybe not even naming the individual who's the who's uh, the subject of the allegation, much more difficult to restrict. But that sort of comes in overlaying the tribunal process and provides a greater protection for those who are uh, complainants than than respondents, effectively. Yes, I can see that. Um, I can see that. So if you step back then, David, just sort of summing, summing this up, general principle of open justice for the reasons you explained yeah. limited circumstances yeah. where partly in reliance on convention rights you may in theory be able to get a degree of confidentiality either during proceedings or sometimes after um, specific examples where things may be if you're a complainant sexual offences there may be protection there if you're, you're the victim of a, a sexual offence um, but in general terms, quite a heavy inclination towards justice is open should be seen to be done, and therefore this is all in the public domain. Yes, and that is true throughout the entire civil, criminal, and tribunal process. Yes, so the tribunals that, aren't different to that extent. Yeah, and 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 that in some respects, but it's a closed world in relation to employment claims unless everyone agrees is why in some areas people like arbitration because and yes. you see arbitration quite commonly in partnership disputes which don't involve allegations relating to discrimination or uh, etc but but the reason of course is that in arbitration you choose to have your dispute determined in a private controlled forum where confidentiality is maintained and that's the attraction so if you take the FA, for example, sure. the FA run uh, the football, the, the uh, procedure for arbitration in football disputes, and occasionally you'll get a decision of an a FA arbitrator being um, determined that it's in the interest of the public that it should be become apparent. Or on occasion you get uh, a sports person appealing that FA yes. decision. But lots of FA decisions, which the press would regard as being manner from heaven to report about players clubs in dispute go on in a confidential arbitration process because they're not engaging these rights that's a matter of choice it's also a matter of cost yes uh, <laughs> like so many things okay that is fantastic I mean, it, it, it's extremely important i think for both sides going into into a tribunal proceedings to be aware of these rules and where the public aspects of a case may take you and it's 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 not a, a it's a it's a double-edged sword in the sense that if you're a claimant you may think that the employer may not want this stuff aired in public but equally if you're a claimant you may not want personal details for example aired in public so um, there are you know these things have to be thought about quite carefully by both parties yes i, I agree with that entirely because you do get claimants who um, think that the publicity angle will be the thing that um, will drive a settlement process because 
the respondent won't want their um, the, the the topic said in public. Um, uh, but of course, you do get respondents who think, in the words of Lord Wellington, if I recollect properly, "publish and be damned." Um, and equally, um, you have respondents who recognise that the claimant themselves may may be equally hesitant about parading their claim in a public forum in circumstances where they may have the perception that their future employability or indeed the media reporting of their conduct might adversely affect upon them. So well, everybody's got the same problem, same basically. Problem. Well, and you get to consider the extent to which newspaper reporting is going to be searchable on Google or whatever uh, years later. So if you're uh, blessed with the name John Smith, you might think you may be able to keep your cover. But if you're blessed with, a, with an unusual combination of names and searching four, five, six years later will bring up as one of the first things that pops up about you the this story, whichever side of the story you're on. Again, that's something to think about. David, that has been fantastically uh, interesting as ever. Thank you. Um, we always are, we always end with a books, film or music round. You know this well enough, being by now uh, just a uh, guest, not a special guest. Um, do you have do you have something you want to recommend to, to, the, to the listeners out there in podcast land? Uh, yes, I was just thinking um, thinking what is the best things that I've read recently? Uh -huh. And in terms of books, I would definitely say that um, uh, there's been a great rush of them recently, but, but my absolute favourite of recent times is William Boyd's latest book, All right. uh, Love is Blind. I really love William Boyd. And okay. His latest novel is really excellent. And when I was thinking about music, I actually thought, OK, I'm going to do a slightly off-the-wall recommendation, which is that I won't recommend a... Uh, uh, an album or an artist I'll recommend a radio programme and I heartily recommend my regular listening to Keris Matthews oh, Radio yes. 6 Sunday mornings available on the BBC iPlayer as they say whenever you want but for an eclectic range I never listen to it without hearing a piece of music I think I've never heard that before and I really like that alright and we did we see we saw her do the show live at Womack we did. That time. We, did we did see her yes. live at Womack. Uh, great yeah. fun. So yeah. there, there, there you have it. Um, so David, thank you very much indeed. That's been really useful, really interesting, given I think people a lot to think about. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you. So that was our latest podcast. We hope you found it useful. If you have any questions or comments, please email Nick on nrobertson at mayorbrown dot com. Our podcasts are an overview of cases. How the law applies in any particular case will obviously depend on the individual circumstances. So please take legal advice if any of the matters discussed are relevant to issues that you are dealing with. And thank you for listening. <laughs>